Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to today's Architectural Digital Future Second Online Robotic Fabrication Lecture on the Frontiers of Intelligent Timber Construction. I'm Tian Yi Gao from Tongji University, and I'm very delighted to host today's forum on this topic. So before we get into the fascinating world of intelligent timber construction, let's take a moment to reflect on the significance of this topic. So timber construction has a rich history, but in the current era, it is undergoing a remarkable transformation thanks to the advancements in digital design tools, robotic technology, and growing emphasis on sustainability. And intelligent timber construction not only offers aesthetically pleasing architectural possibilities, but also holds the promise of reducing environmental impacts, enhancing building energy efficiency, and opening up no chances for freeform timber structure design. And this forum is a platform for us to explore the cutting edge innovation, challenges, and opportunities within the realm of timber construction. And last week, we invited three, three scholars to share their latest research on the digital design and industrial supply chain of timber construction. And this time, we will gather, uh, we have gathered a diverse group of experts, architects, and scholars all over the world who will focus more on the robotic fabrication and the body material. And today's event will be divided into two sections, um, the lecture presentation and the roundtable discussion. And in the first 90 minutes, we will have the privilege of hearing from our three keynote speakers as they share their latest research findings and insight. And following the presentations, we have a fantastic opportunity to engage in an open and free-flowing roundtable discussion for the next 30 to, to 40 minutes. And it is a free talk, so everybody can have a chance to actively practice, uh, participate, ask questions, share thoughts, and explore the depths of our topic. So first, firstly, let's, let me introduce the three keynote speakers in the order in the will be presented. The first presenter, Dr. Sorry, I think yeah. it's okay. It's also uh, it's a bit silent. Yeah, no. it was okay, and now. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with your with your? No, it's, good. it's good. It's good. Yeah. Okay. So continue. So the first presenter, Dr. Patrick, is a postdoctoral researcher in a Block Research Group ETH. He's Research focus on digital de design, digital timber fabrication, scanning method, robotic tool path planning, development of advanced timber structures, and project based applications. He has extensive experience teaching masters, bachelor students, and conducting academic and commercial workshops. His work with interdisciplinary teams, including architects, structural engineer, engineers, and computer scientists, has enriched his knowledge and skills in this field. And the second presenter is Dr. Chai Hua, who is a, also a postdoctoral researcher at, at the College of Architecture and Urban Planning of Tongji University. His research focuses on the computational design and robotic production technology for innovative timber building systems. He received his PhD from a PhD degree from Tongji University in 2022. He has been awarded Young Kedra and Digital Futures Young. He, had, he was also awarded the Fellowship of China National Postdoctoral Program for Innovative Talents in 2022. And he has also been involved in leading several international workshops, including Digital Futures, Ekedra 2020. And the last presenter is Professor Tom Suvillian, an architect, designer, consultant, and researcher focusing on digital, digital fabrication, material reality, and computational design modeling. And Tom is currently an, an assistant professor at CETA at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen, Denmark. His research focuses on the digital design across timber value chain from forestry to, con to construction and methods of integrating new imaging and information communication technologies in the design and fabrication of engineered timber elements. As a consultant, he specializes in this computational modeling, design development, and fabrication coordination of complex timber structure. So without further delay, let's welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Petros, who is a leading authority on the raw timber joint design and fabrication 
So Dr. Petrus, we are eager to hear from your exciting topic. So please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for, for a very nice introduction and I'm really grateful to be here. I'll start my, my, share, my screen share. Um, first, uh, first question, do you see the screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So I just recently started a block research group so a few months, uh, but for the past six years, uh, I did my PhD and also postdoc at uh, EPFL at IBOA, uh, Laboratory for Timber Construction. And this kind of, it's a bit like six years of, of, of the chapter that I had in my life and I would like to share it with you. Um, so my presentation is divided in, in four parts. The first part is, is what is the IBOA and its applications from the past and current. Then I go directly into like very nerdy topic of timber joinery, like how we can develop timber joinery uh, conceptually and, and tool-wise. Uh, then we had this tool that gradually developed for the reasons of irregular uh, timber, uh, essentially scanning methods, a tool called cockroach. And then I end up uh, the fourth chapter that is called raw wood and its prototypes and applications. So let's start, I'll start from the first uh, point and what was the Iboa like line of research? It started actually from not from these kind of applications, but but started from geometrical explorations what you can do with timber plates. And gradually there was introduction of timber joints, and only then engineering thesis started. And and lastly we tried to actually combine everything from the past, and, uh, and then there, there was opportunity to have these applications in in real world. It's not like pavilions, but more more real projects, which has a bit other challenges uh, when, when you need to, to actually develop it through. Uh, so majority of us are engineers, so we're engineers and architects, but we love the fabrication process and love to go from 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 these two worlds. In my opinion, 80% of timber structures is, if you can do it fabrication-wise, if you can validate, then you can do this other processes of engineering and architectural design as well. But three first steps is the fabrication. Now I go to the first project, uh, which I worked on besides my thesis. It was an Aboko opera scene. It was essentially a, a spiral stair that was that was one of the two parts of the project. Uh, the first part was the stairs, essentially the stage. And the second part were benches, so people to watch an opera. And we build it from timber panels, so they are quite thin. Um, it's like 27 millimeters free fleet panels. Um, at that time, it was a nice opportunity that we, we were developing this project, but at that time we also created this open source tool called Open Nest, essentially to nest those project panels to a series of um, yeah, free fleet panels. We also developed during several generations of PhDs a tool called Raccoon, which is essentially for cutting uh, elements, uh, planner or beams using the, essentially the G-code and CNC machine. All these boxes are composed from these uh, side plates and they also have a bracing inside because structurally we needed like a more rigid box inside. And it's all hanged up for, from a series of cables from the central church uh, tower. We also had to scan everything not only to get a 3D model, but also you have to get as much seats as possible uh, because in the end it's a commercial event and you need to sell those tickets. And then there was also uh, an interesting application of uh, snap fit joints that we had done at Iboa before. Uh, so when you cut timber in in a, in, in a micro scale, you can actually can, can already bend because differently to other materials, uh, timber can, can be bent and you can also use this for for joinery design, you can assemble and ideally disassemble uh, the structure. And I think uh, lately they even uh, had another contract to the church, uh, meaning that they, they built uh, benches using uh, snap fit joints, but using a proper material, like a, a oak material rather than those cheap uh, OSB panels that we use for temper uh, event. The second project I was working on, um, it was a bit of interesting history. Um, it is a project has this kind of connection when the three plates comes to one plate together. 
um, and you need to do some geometrical tricks to, to align those uh, joints in order to construct these series of uh, box uh, box kind of arch. Um, and and uh, from historical point of view of Hibois, uh, Christopher Robler, a previous postdoc and PhD student, left, and I had this project uh, happening, uh, and I had to uh, re recode, I think, like three or four times this whole thing, uh, and transfer also geometry for engineers, because two engineering thesis uh, started um, on this. And it was interesting to, to know, like, just a bit of background stories that that this um, uh, engineering calculation models have had started, but the first very first arch was actually modeled by hand, uh, and you can imagine how tedious this process is. In one arch, there are around nine hundred plates, and in order to have these FEM models, you actually have to click every single plate point by point. It takes a long time; it's not error prone, and the goal was actually to make a code that is applicable for for all these arches. Um, as you might know from the past, these arches are composed from boxes. Uh, first, they are assembled one by one, like lying on the ground. Then the whole arch is rotated 90 degrees, and then it's placed on uh, in the actual position. So gently, without any, any any accidents and so on. Regarding the like statistics, it's the smallest arch is around 23 meters long. Uh, the widest one is 54 meters long. Each box. Uh, requires a static height to, to span such spans and it's around 70 centimeters from, from, from the two layers, like from the very top edges. Yeah, and, and interestingly to see that there is these projects uh, or, or tests inside the lab, but once the, the project gets out of laboratory, it's a bit of a different world because it's not only the research happening, but also the, the companies for engineering for uh, architecture that also had to solve several uh, important points. For instance, also you can see there's the whole cladding on on the structure itself. Um, there are window details, and currently it's it's almost finished project. But but there's a lot of like you know these roof uh, elements as well. All these things had to be considered along the way. It's not only joinery. It's not about the structure. But once the building needs to be built, it has to function as a whole system. So for me, it was really nice to opportunity to actually start the with that and learn from the previous researchers and then gradually build a knowledge uh, around it. Uh, yeah, so you can see the, the, these arches uh, gradually lifted uh, from the ground and all of them are covered for, from the rain as well. And then you see gradually they are built sequentially in one big sequence. Now, again, some, some background information. If you go inside the lab itself, um, it is a university um, that has uh, essentially equipment to cut those timber elements. Um, and I, I, in the postdoc, uh, like lately, I spent uh, one and a half years just acquiring a BB robot um, with this nine meter track. We have two of them. One is was from one lab, but another one we got with a 15 kilowatt spindle. So it was. It was around 115 emails sent between ABB and EPSL and it was actually acquired. So it's it's not about these fancy images, but also this kind of expensive equipment that needs to be purchased and needs to be installed as well. We also have a CNC machine that is around uh, or had from, from two to five meters length. So typically it was used for cutting panels, but we also had this additional access for cutting beams from, from all sides. So there are these two applications that can cut and can assemble uh, equally, and depending on the scale and integration, you can use them within the school. Um, besides these, uh, the architectural research, I'm coming from a very small country, Lithuania, and I, I finished my master's bachelor's in, in Vilnius Arts Academy. And uh, there we don't have these, these fancy uh, expensive equipment. But we, but we try from time to time come back and make workshops. Like for instance, this was a publication at AEG. We tried to make a very similar structure what we saw before, but made from from cardboard uh, in all these di different angles using a two layer system. And this was interestingly uh, my wife's actually master thesis at at CETA. Uh, Tom is also uh, from CETA, and um, at that time there was small scale prototypes, and, and we actually 
managed to go to the school and convince them and to build a, a full scale prototype. And then there was a lot of challenge, not only making, but, but the whole communication between students, between the school, even the as simple as a cardboard uh, prototype. Um, then uh, recently I spent like one year trying to teach what I know or what I knew from, from my own experience. Uh, a master student at, at the school and we tried to make a prototype using uh, those uh, Woodwood connections because they also have a CNC machine, not as large, but you can also do cuttings in all direction. And I was like watching on this phone the ladder defense, so it was really, really interesting. Um, so, so this was a bit background story uh, of, of Libra applications, and now I'm going to the second uh, topic, timber joinery. Something that I was really curious about, I'm, I'm really interested in this topic, and I really learned, learned a lot from this. Um, Iboa, for a very long time, had uh, this application of uh, timber connection for plates, and besides these projects, you have to really check the assembly sequence, the tolerances, and so on. In my work, I was learning from the plates and gradually trying to apply the same logic or similar logics to, um, to the straight elements and also regular elements. And there are some things that really overlap. And <clears throat> the way you need to think is that the joints is not the shape. The joints comes from fabrication tools. It, it's as, uh, as banal, as simple as this. What kind of tools you have is what kind of joints you can make. And usually they can be inscribed in these kind of box elements. And in codes, there are usually two kinds of representations. You have plates, essentially two outlines coming together. Or for instance, I was also learning from Storm's students uh, when you have the axis and a series of planes. So there are these few models that do exist within this academic uh, institutes. I was trying to merge both of the worlds. Um, and you can also... No, you, you also need to represent the hierarchy because you need to represent clusters of elements. You need to represent, let's say, forks or regular elements as well. And once you go into these kind of boring commercial catalogs where you can find a lot of timber joints, um, it's interesting to hear that, um, that timber joint is not a shape. A timber joint is simply a cut from, from positive and negative, like female and male element. And you, you cannot physically see, but you, you only can see it by, by cutting. And you also need to track adjacency. And to make this actually work, I'm going gradually to the code and logic behind it. You, you, you have a few strategies that, that seem to be common in a lot of papers. First, you can actually do the intersection between series of curves or lines, or you can do the face-to-face -face detection. You can also do cross detection and other collision methods. But the problem is that they are really, really slow methods if you just apply it like that. So for this reason, uh, the most common technique is to apply a very quick search, like earth tree search or other tree search methods. And when it comes to joint, it's also quite simple once you actually know what it is. Uh, a joint can be simply described like a, like a 2D shape that can be simply shared using change of basis transformation. So it's a very simple matrix transformation. And then you can apply it also to a series of outlines. There are a few tricks that you need to uh, go around, but the end of the goal is, is that you see this visualization, but, but the starting point is actually this orientation. It's, it's kind, of, kind of straightforward, but you have to do it very neatly in a kind of coding, uh, co coding way. Um, then there are a series of Boolean methods for visualization, as I mentioned. And for plates, it's actually quite straightforward and simple because you only need to do it in 2D, so it's fast. But when you have like beams, uh, like bend beams, so if you have regular beams, you actually need to cut out uh, using these algorithms from Brian or from like Seagull. But to my, to my opinion, they, they are still not very reliable and, and you have to be really careful how, how you actually initiate those ones. But I had the challenge to really set up the, the workflow that the booleans are working correctly. Why I'm talking about this, uh, it is because there were a series of applications that we had. For instance, the first one is a side-side topology when you simply want, want to engrave a, a group on the side. And there was also interesting inspiration from Lock Research Group from Armadillo World Group where they have this kind of very simple edge key, but this is kind of a very simple side connection. You can apply it also for round with slabs. You can apply it for end-to-end -end connections. 
And it's interestingly that shape wise, like once you see those images, they seem to be completely different from code perspective. And they also are more or less similar between beams and plates. It just looks different, but it's kind of the same in the code. The second topology is side to top topology, meaning you have a connections that forms uh, T elements. And they also have beam and plates kind of very similar in that case. But as I mentioned, before you need to go through this fabrication process because it's a bit subtle and different once you have beams and you have plates you have to introduce additional cuts and structurally they also must be viable elements the last one i showed this um, box element and, and, the, and the one that is cross topology that is also very known in reciprocal systems um, and there are a lot of sub topologies as well so i like this world of actually seeing a joint trying to understand how it's cut because it's not only the shape, it's also about the fabrication process. And then you can actually start playing with this because you understand how, how the language works. You can apply it for different angles. You can introduce different connectors. You can introduce different curvatures of beams. Um, yeah. And, and then again, they're applicable for plates and beams as well. So I did this PhD at Tiboa and I was really curious to to get out of this Rhino world, it, it's a really great uh, software. But for instance, what happens if there will be a no, new version? What you end up doing is usually updating your code, checking what has been changed. So I, I wanted to make a standalone tool. So I learned this C++ language. Uh, I learned uh, how to actually introduce those geometries in a, a standalone code. Wrote my own uh, visualizer to actually display your geometry for a very simple pragmatic reason in order to check that joinery works correctly instead of dealing with the whole interface of other softwares. So that, that I really liked. Um, and I think it was also a challenge for me to learn. And then I went to Block Research Group and asked Tom for a meeting uh, and asked, can, can you introduce me what is like composite to courses from them? But I didn't really know, know how to create a package. So he explained me these first steps, a bit struggle in the beginning, and then they, I, I got the logic. And the way it works, there is this C++ background in the back, and it's wrapped uh, uh, to the uh, Python environment, Compass environment through, um, through PyMind 11, which was a common strategy at that time at, at Compass. Then also a university invested around 30,000 francs for making the tutorials on this, plus the history of Ibua. So if, you, if you're not really curious about these codes, about these joints, but you are curious about the, the timber plate structures, there's EDX course, which is free. You don't need to pay a certificate because I don't have, get any cent from this. <laughs> but, but there's one chapter that is talking about uh, these timber plates. And plus, you can really get all the, all the recordings from, from what was happening in the past. And in my opinion, there is this world of like coding and so on, but a lot of things things are still solved very pragmatically on piece of paper, pencil, and so on. So we need to know a few strategies how, how we approach uh, several projects. And then it was interesting, like, turn at Ibua, uh, because uh, there was, like, join, 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 joins. And, and suddenly, the whole group was interested in a, a series of um, scanning methods, uh, because we started to dealing with elements uh, such as rocks, such as uh, round timbers. We, we, got these kind of uh, expensive laser scanners um, that could scan, you know, this regular material, but but the question is how you can get something useful from this. You need to post-process this data. And I think right now the guys even went further using only cameras without this expensive equipment, but still it was um, useful for, for us to develop a tool that allows you to crop these clouds to to the skeleton nice, for instance, the forks, for very pragmatic reason for fabrication. So not for big, you know, buildings, but just for um, for, for digital or, or manual fabrication. And, and the idea is that there are these libraries, open for EPCL, Cilantro, and Seagull. If you know how to use it, use it. But if you, if, if you want, you can also wrap this into Rhino so that architects so that don't want or don't have skills uh, can use it as well. And I think recently they mentioned that they are pushing this even forward and we even got the best paper award uh, from this. It was kind of an interesting thing because it was not during our work time, it was after the work that, that we actually did this tool. 
So for my work, I needed just a sim simple central axis and a series of circles, which is Seagull synchronization running in, in Cockroach. Um, then I was using the scanner simply to orient multiple point clouds together uh, on the robot itself. An interesting thing is that from those libraries, you get uh, kind of for free because they open source. You can get this uh, stock of uh, timber, for instance, in my research. You can scan it with four, and then you can place an element on the rig, and you can do the point out to uh, point out alignment. The only trick that you have to have around the 70% of overlaying points, which is usually the case for, for fabrication. So in my work, I was using point clouds to orient two paths in, in a robot space. As, uh, yeah. And to, to summarize the, the vision tools, the way it was uh, in, in my work, we always get this raw noise data. You need to crop more or less in the place that is around the robot. You need to orient it. Uh, you need to orient the tool paths. So we have this older ABB that is, can, can mill, can, can use a saw blade, can also use a scanner. I think this was very first robot. It was a bit older one, um, and we learned a lot for, from this whole experience. Um, interestingly enough, that we changed a bit of uh, like model of, of actually acquiring equipment from external companies to actually hiring uh, electricians and mechanical engineers who, who can do this kind of work in house for two reasons: it, it's much more cheaper, and uh, you you can actually do it much more quickly close by to your robot and then always going for these meetings, acquiring funds and so on. Um, so this was some lesson learned. And in this case, you can see this kind of uh, tool head that has a shrink plates uh, with a milling tool and uh, and a scanner. And you can, you can change it quite, quite simply between the tool. And we also did it for the new robot and we saw that we, we know how to do it ourselves. You, you can learn it, uh, I mean, uh, now I'm going to the last chapter, Robot, <clears throat> and there is a bit of history how it was introduced at Ibor. It was introduced because there was a collaboration between local mountain forestry in Swiss Alps. So if, if you imagine the, the, the Alps in Switzerland, they are very steep, and, and the forestry is really, really uh, different from the flat uh, you know, areas, meaning that you have this cable system, sometimes you have helicopters, you actually bring those uh, trunks to, to the cutting site. And I was the student who was bringing the scanner to scan, you know, like uh, yeah, those tree trunks. Um, and it was interesting to see that you cannot actually get these kind of timbers that are normally like 20 or 40 meters length in full, because you have to have a truck that gradually goes all the way from Alps down the hill and those little roads are so small that you cannot have a huge truck and then and then you have this five meter truck that is essentially what timber panels or timber beams become like this is uh, the minimal length so okay and the second point was that um you, you it was five meter max and below 30 centimeters round wood is not normally used for uh, for structural material it's discarded normally as you know for for fire it can be used but it's not a structural material but you can to some extent also introduce these joinery uh, and for straight and regular timbers i was also asking from this uh, local forestry just to get me standard planks what they actually do in local sawmills i was building these prototypes out of hexagonal uh, boxes and also introduced into this uh, timber that is normally was completely wet, not dried properly, but we are playing and trying to introduce a joinery instead of using heavy steel fasteners because the, uh, the idea behind a lot of projects you bought was, was really using only wood, wood connections. And it was a bit of philosophy of how we approach different uh, projects. Um, and I had this opportunity also to participate in an exhibition in Zurich. Um, it was touch wood exhibition, and uh, my, my work was uh, made from this round wood. But it was also interesting to to, to be next to these, you know, the, the masters, you know, the on the back you can see Blue Malerman beam, the blue lamb made for swatch building, and uh, next to it I'm the student, this kind of regular, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, arch. So I think that there are two worlds. There is this academic world, but once things gets actually built, 
you would need also to learn a lot what are the materials and maybe some of the actual those regular elements have a potential and one of the possible potentials uh, there are future applications at Tibua they are going to to start uh, I think construction and the project um, in Rosinia trying to use those uh, rectangular um, those post-process uh, elements um, and I worked on this project quite a lot to, to create this kind of very simple shell structure, not a large span, um, yeah, for, for this two-story building. And a second application uh, was trying to merge timber plates of the uh, um, raw timbers. And there's a, a bit of reason why, why we would like to do it. Uh, raw timber is, is not necessarily the most, uh, the best material because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's down the chain. It's the cheapest material in Europe. You can buy 200 euros per, uh, per cubic meter. In Switzerland, 300 francs per cubic meter. Uh, so it's cheap, but it's not very performative. But then you can also use panels that is a bit less, less sustainable, but you can use less of this material in your structure. And we had this opportunity to, to build a prototype one to, to five. And I really enjoyed working with the carpenters because you always think about this kind of digital tools, but carpenters without computers sometimes have more skills than than, than a student in, in Rhino. And we are learning from each other really a lot. And in this case, I'm mimicking the raw timber using the simple, simple hardwood dowel um, that creates a system that you can think that is either um, beams braced with panels or vice versa panels braced with beams. So it has, has this kind of Zollinger system. And then we managed to scale scale it up to one to one scale. Uh, so these kind of little beams that you, you see here, like these long beams is actually a connection element here. Uh, and that is another one, uh, uh, like the smaller one is like two centimeter dowel. And, and the thick one is five centimeter dowel. They go inside each other and they interlock. Um, and what they do, they create this kind of, um, again, the same system of scale to uh, one to one. And I was responsible for this uh, prototype um, for preparing uh, the tool path. Uh, and was the last project uh, I worked uh, before leaving. And the reason why it was, uh, um, it was, I think, one year before. For the we participated in competition that the competition was won by architects in collaboration with us, and and the function was a bit like crazy, but but there was very short a footprint on the on the ground floor, and they needed to build really a sports hall on on the roof of this whole building, and they needed to have like a simple roof as they can, um, which now becomes this round wood application that that you see a very small piece of this. And it's, a, it's an ongoing project of Tibua still today. At this point, I'm going to end, uh, and I would like really to thank you for inviting me, and and also I really would like to thank you for for watching uh, this uh, presentation for all the audience. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen at this very moment. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Precious, for your enlightening you know, presentation. I'm I'm sure. Uh, our panelists and audience can wait to share their insights sparked by your research. But let's just, let's firstly keep this question to the next roundtable part. And now let's move mm -hmm. on to the uh, to our next keynote speaker. Please welcome Dr. Trevor. Okay. Okay, can you all see my screen? Hello? Yeah, we can, we can see your screen. All good? Okay, we can see it. Okay, and uh, uh, the main topic is a platform based robotic wood construction. And uh, I'm Chai Hua, I'm from Tokyo University. I just finished my PhD research uh, uh, one and a half years ago, and uh, now I'm a postdoc researcher at, uh, uh, in the team of Professor Philip Yuan here. And uh, actually, I have been involved in the research of timber uh, 
uh, fabrication with uh, robotics uh, from 2000, uh, 2014 and actually a series of uh, workshops, uh, exhibitions, and uh, also two projects have been carried out in collaboration with uh, Fabuni, Akiuni, and also uh, SDH Tukart. And uh, actually, uh, my research has, uh, uh, is starts uh, from our investigation in the timber construction industry. And the, uh, in, the, in the industry today, uh, especially in, in China, we can see different kind of uh, specialized uh, uh, timber machining center, which is developed to autom uh, automate the, the prefabrication process of uh, a lot of uh, existing timber structures. Uh, actually, in the process of the automation, uh, the flexibility of this kind of machining center is uh, very hard to adapt to the uh, design innovation in architecture. Uh, in contrast, uh, we have and we have uh, also seen that the uh, academia field have uh, uh, have witnessed the emergence of a lot of innovative uh, timber construction system, and uh, uh, they they take the robot as a new generation of uh, fabrication tools, and also. Integrated, uh, integrated robotic fabrication in the uh, in uh, design phase in the engineer engineering process through the parametric uh, control of robots, and uh, the robot have uh, already showed their uh, adaptability to uh, all kind of uh, different system, uh, including what uh, patches have uh, just showed us. And uh, with the advancement of the robotic fabrication technique, and also with the diffusion of th this kind of uh, innovation in, from the academia field to the industry field, the ro uh, robotic uh, platform have uh, become a new trend of development. And the platform try to uh, try to redefine the construction paradigm of the process of uh, the different construction scenarios with uh, 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 by uh, import the cutting edge achievement in, in the research field, such as the mobile technology, the different kind of uh, uh, end effectors, sensors, and also the uh, uh, state of the art uh, uh, control technology and common robot platform uh, uh, like the fixed uh, uh, gantry robot and also the trans transportable or mobile platform and also swarm system which is a uh, uh, more uh, maybe maybe to be a which should would be for the development to be more sophisticated and uh, so uh, in Tongjian University, we have the opportunity to uh, dive into this area to uh, develop the two kind of uh, uh, robot platform for uh, timber construction. Uh, one is uh, a prefabrication pre platform, which is a large scale uh, fixed, uh, fixed gantry system uh, developed for uh, large scale uh, offsite prefabrication and targeting as a um, uh, mass customization of uh, complex timber structures. And another is a, a mobile platform which could move freely on site and could conduct uh, automatic Lambo uh, tasks on site. So uh, the platform was. What we call the platform-based construction is not only about the, uh, the uh, uh, not only a question of automation like the machining center. It's also uh, an opportunity for the innovation in the architecture design or structure system development. So in this context, we are interested in exploring the uh, interaction between the robot robot platform and the building system uh, through the development of a uh, uh, 
different kind of solutions for timber construction. And uh, today I'm going to show two applications, actually two projects. Uh, uh, one is a uh, uh, mobile robotic timber uh, fabrication project, uh, which is focused on the in situ construction of a, a, a structure we call the spatial glue line. And then the for the prefabrication, uh, we uh, a, a nature tree fox structure will be shown today. So we'll, I will start with the spatial glue line one. So this research starts uh, with the concept that uh, uh, it displays the many advantages in prefabrication. The timber structure actually suffer from the constraint of the uh, standardization and uh, uh, modularization, and also the constraint of the transportations. And so for uh, timber construction, uh, uh, especially for the multi-story constructions, there's uh, uh, constrained a lot by the uh, grid-based uh, uh, floor plan. And uh, actually there's no on-site fabrication, uh, no on-site fabrication system for uh, large scale structures that could be compared to the uh, uh, on-site uh, fabricated uh, reinforced concrete structure. So in this context, we uh, we are aiming to tackle exactly this problem of on-site timber construction with this uh, uh, customized mobile robot platform, uh, which was uh, developed to be flexibly uh, deployable for uh, different kind of on-site uh, uh, timber construction tasks. So the platform is uh, consists of an uh, industrial robot arm and uh, installed on a track platform, and also uh, with a customized tool station for timber processing, and and also a a, a camera is uh, mounted to lo uh, localize the robots on site by identifying some uh, pre embedded markers. So the, the rich envelope of the platform is uh, developed to be uh, cover typical ceiling and floor height. And uh, the gripper as a, a gripper with a automated nail gun is uh, uh, mounted on the on the robot to uh, on the in, as the end factor to conduct uh, demo tasks. And also the glue station is fixed on the platform uh, to apply glue during the uh, a demo. So with this setup, the timber structure can be uh, robotically assembled from uh, discrete elements uh, through uh, a repetition of the series of uh, uh, fabrication process from gluing, uh, uh, take, uh, apply glue, position the beam, and then nail the game. beam. So with this kind of nail glue hybrid uh, connection, uh, this kind of uh, example can be regarded as a, 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 a customized glue line structure as an extension of the con common concept of the glue laminated timber. Uh, so based on this, uh, the possibility of uh, such a, a mobile robot platform, we're trying to explore uh, some novel design opportunity for timber construction. Uh, so we uh, conceptualize uh, this kind of uh, uh, building system we call the uh, uh, new kind of glue line beam network. So that uh, uh, which is uh, demoed by the robot platform from uh, uh, underneath to reinforce a uh, pre-erected uh, uh, column and uh, slab. And uh, so this system could, uh, 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 it's not limited by this kind of grid uh, floor plan, and uh, uh, it can uh, transform the, uh, uh, the floor plan of a timber structure, especially multi-story timber structure to network uh, uh, floor plan. And uh, oh, so at the heart of this kind I mean, of- uh, 
muito alto, hein? So, uh, the, the key of this uh, building system is the development of the uh, material efficient beam network, which is uh, compatible with the uh, uh, capacity of the robot platform. So in this case, we, uh, we, we, uh, we design this uh, uh, beam network uh, with uh, timber stakes, which can be uh, iteratively placed and uh, uh, connected with uh, nail and glue on side with the robot. Uh, so the computational design of the, this kind of network takes the result of a, a topology of optimization and uh, the access is, is extracted to uh, generate the uh, pattern and the stakes are arranged with a region-based modeling approach to uh, make sure that all the states uh, do not collide with each other and uh, they uh, the the uh, their relationship could uh, be uh, adapted to the constraint of the robotic uh, fabrication process and uh, this is a basic uh, combination of the states and uh, uh, this kind of combination could be a uh, adapt to different situation in the beam in the axis layout and such as the branching and the converging uh, stream of the beam axis uh, and uh, with this system we developed the case study pavilion in 2021 and uh, we, uh, it's uh, developed together with FabUni and the uh, SD and uh, and the pavilion uh, actually is a real project. Uh, it's uh, uh, used uh, as a, a car shed in Fabuni, and it, it consists of two CLT panels uh, supported by eight columns. And the, the generation of the beam network is uh, essential, essentially the, you know, uh, a negotiation between different kind of uh, design conditions, uh, fabrication constraints, and the material uh, mm -hmm. properties. So uh, this is uh, how we use the ABM uh, uh, approach to develop this uh, the the beam network on the uh, slide. And uh, after that, the, the construction sequence can be summarized. Uh, as uh, first we erect the prefabricated column and uh, then the first uh, uh, roof will be installed and uh, the robot will be uh, and the roof will be uh, temporarily temporarily supported by some uh, stakes and uh, then the robot will be uh, moved on uh, underneath to reinforce the, this uh, roof with the uh, stakes and after that, the second uh, panel will be inserted from the front, and uh, then the robot moving again. And uh, uh, after all the uh, robotic fabrication uh, have been finished, we will uh, then uh, uh, finish the uh, pop of the roof. So first, uh, the roof panel is hoisted in place, and then uh, the robots will be located. It will be moved on site, and first it need to be located itself by uh, recognize the uh, uh, pre embedded uh, markers on the CLT panels. So uh, we use the total station to first uh, collaborate all the markers, and then the uh, camera mounted on the on, on the end effector of the robot will be used to uh, identify the markers nearby. And then uh, the, uh, uh, the the location of the markers will be transformed to uh, into the coordinate system of the robot, uh, the the root of the robot, so the robots could know where to uh, fabricate, uh, where where to place the stakes for them uh, for this uh, location. And uh, after the localization, the robot will grab uh, grab the element from the storage, uh, then apply glue uh, at the glue station, 
and uh, place element in place and uh, fix it with uh, uh, nails. So the uh, robot would uh, uh, fabricate this uh, integrated uh, uh, structures uh, in a continuous process. And uh, uh, at this, uh, as this structure is uh, uh, constructed, constructed the direct alongside, so there's no need to assemble or uh, design any uh, uh, prefabricated joint anymore. And uh, actually, this uh, uh, car shed uh, achieve a maximum of a, a, a span of five meters with a, a thickness of the the field panel is only 60 millimeter. And we also take a, a area with the largest uh, uh, span uh, as an example to uh, uh, um, evaluate the position of the construction. And we, we use a three scan scanner uh, to get the model of it. And the results show that the error distribution of the Without uh, a constraint within uh, plus or minus three millimeter, uh, this is also for the robot to perform quite high precision construction outside, uh, taking into uh, all the construction errors and the robot uh, repositioning errors. And uh, I, what uh, this is uh, another. Uh, this is actually a workshop we uh, really uh, in last year, I think. And uh, this is trying, we trying to provide the student with a, a robot platform and try to see what uh, what we can, what they can develop with this kind of new uh, concept of fabrication. And uh, this is quite exciting to see they trying to uh, transform this the grid we the the uh the grid to a special grid system and this and we also can see the potential in extending the uh robots to a different kind of uh, uh constructing scenario like this one it's a, a scenario that uh envisaging uh uh an extension of a high-rise high rise, high rise uh, 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 high rise buildings. And so um, that's the first uh, uh, platform and the first project. And the following is our research on a nature tree fork structure taking use of the robotic prefabrication platform. Uh, and uh, um, uh, a very brief, brief introduction of the platform. And uh, this platform is initially developed uh, uh, about seven to eight years ago. And uh, the it consists of a three-axis uh, uh, gantry system equipped with two uh, Koka robots. And it uh, provides sufficient uh, capacity for from large-scale fabrication and also the uh, Cooperative uh, uh, fabrication with the uh, two robots, and uh, also uh, a set of uh, timber fabrication uh, and effect that have been developed uh, at the two library. So in doing this research, we uh, utilize the uh, collaboration of the two robots to address the challenge of the uh, nature tree fox uh, construction. So actually, this project is the outcome of a very short-term teaching program. It's uh, only around two months, uh, uh, half a semester. And at the start of the program, we happened to learn that uh, 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 a wood in Pudong district, Shanghai, is uh, being demolished. And actually, during this uh, demolishment, uh, all the large-scale uh, large diameter logs, uh, which is uh, 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 seems to have a very high economic value, was um, uh, collected and moved away. And then a lot of uh, small diameter, irregular shaped uh, tree folks are left behind as a 
at this, uh, the site as waste. And uh, we also conduct some uh, very uh, 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 conduct some research uh, about this kind of uh, uh, harvesting uh, process of uh, timber. Uh, uh, actually, a significant amount of wood, wood is wasted, including not only the uh, 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 the processing waste uh, from trees to timber products, but also some very small diameter wood, the uh, and also tree faults are uh, excluded from the outside uh, uh, as a, as a construction material. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in the ancient time of uh, uh, in traditional China, uh, nature would have uh, uh, been uh, commonly used as building materials uh, because it uh, offers a range of uh, advantages like, like this uh, 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 low, very uh, environmental friendly uh, property and also its uh, durability. And however, it's also uh, ex uh, have the, this uh, irregularities in size and in, sh in its shape and also its uh, uh, performance uh, due to the uh, nature growing uh, nature yeah so it's very challenging to uh, processly measure and uh, simulate the uh, this kind of material and it's also hard uh, for uh, uh, architects to design, make design with this kind of material. So uh, in this project, we uh, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the group of students trying to address the challenge uh, uh, with, uh, by introducing the uh, cooperative robotic fabrication. So uh, we established uh, this uh, integrity workflow, which uh, 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 including include the material uh, side, the design side, and also the fabrication side. And uh, uh, the proposed master is uh, then evaluated uh, uh, through the construction of a, a tree a tree fog based the tau structure in. Uh, this year's study the future activities. And uh, so from the site, uh, we and the group of students uh, randomly collect uh, 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 90, uh, 91 components from the site and uh, include uh, 30 curved ones and uh, 61 uh, hooked ones. And uh, then we use uh, this uh, photogram uh, uh, grammetry uh, method for 3D scanning. And uh, actually, this method is quite simple, but uh, uh, we also take the use of an, uh, an uh, commercial software. I think it's called uh, Reality Capture. And actually, this method could uh, provide very high position scanning results. And uh, with a group of uh, uh, elements arranged uh, uh, properly, and uh, it can take photo of this group of elements with a, a, a very a cheap smartphone. And then the software will generate very high resolution 3D model with also with uh, their texture information. And the, uh, then the model will be a, 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 the model of each element will be derived by segmenting the uh, uh, the, the uh, model uh, output by software. And after that, the model was uh, uh, post processed uh, uh, in four different forms uh, in Grasshopper to uh, uh, address the different requirements. Uh, uh, of a different process in the design of application. And first, uh, the initial mesh model is, uh, uh, could provide sufficient accuracy for the material, for, for the computer vision based uh, 
uh, uh, material localization process. And the uh, centroid curve and the cross section model could use the uh, in the material allocation process. And the simplified mesh model is a uh, much lightweight in uh, modeling the joints and uh, also detect the collision in the robotic simulation process. And the uh, axis angle uh, process can be used uh, can can be used to generate a coordinated system. It can be used to transform the um, different models in in the design process. So each component is uh, assigned with a unique ID, and uh, uh, all the components supervise uh, this material library for the project. And the design uh, objective is to develop the, a tower structure around nine meters in, near a cafe in uh, Tongji University, and uh, and it's uh, 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 designed to be ex exhibited in the event of architecture that is the future this year. And uh, some basic concept is first uh, developed be before the uh, plan. And first, the uh, three folks uh, will be joined at uh, the, their open end along the fiber direction, so we can make use of the material strength along the uh, fiber. And uh, also, uh, given that the joints also serve, an, uh, serve as an exploration of the robotic fabrication uh, the, the, to, to explore the potential of the robotic fabrication process. So we select the, the uh, integral attachment uh, as a connector. And uh, after that, uh, we, uh, to, to accommodate the shape of the different nature tree folks, so the initial axis is uh, designed to be uh, all, the, all the nodes at the Axis is designed to be the connection of three axes. So the initial axis then uh, is achieved through the uh, uh, graphic statics uh, based approach, and which can also uh, establish a link between the structure elements and their inner inner forces. And after that, the material is uh, uh, allocated through the evaluation of the compatibility. Uh, of the uh, material with the target axis uh, lines. So uh, the, the compatibility is evaluated uh, uh, through different kind of uh, parameter, like the length of the element, the section, their sections, and also the, the angles. And uh, after all the, after the allocation, they will be optimized with the uh, uh, other Precise uh, like uh, the, uh, the structure evaluation, and uh, if the evaluation says it's okay, and it uh, if if it's not okay, it will be uh, moved back to uh, change some parameter in the allocation process and to do a reallocation. If it's okay, it will be move on to the next uh, step of uh, joint modeling and the construction. Uh, uh, the construction process. So in the in the end, the total of uh, uh, forty eight components, uh, uh, forty eight folk component was used, and his here is the allocation plan for all the components, and the right part uh, uh, indicating the part to be removed. So the design of the structure is especially the joint will also be designed to. Uh, Fit the construction tools, uh, the fabrication tools. So this research uh, it's, uh, developed two kind of end effectors. One is responsible for the uh, subtractive processing and also uh, visual uh, localization. And uh, the, the other one is uh, dedicated to comp uh, clamps uh, components during the fabrication process. So, uh, as most uh, uh, research on this kind of uh, uh, nature tree folks fabrication will this uh, uh, texture to plants to the components, uh, but uh, the the texture needs to be adjusted uh, every time the material changes. So, 
as in our research, the uh, elements is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, lightweight and the, the, the diameter is quite small. So we directly use the uh, gripper to uh, climb the, uh, the, the elements uh, uh, throughout the fabrication process. And, the, and the also in this regard, we developed the, the also the integral, atta uh, integral attachments. We uh, select a half, half scarf joint as uh, 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 with two uh, pins uh, as a prototype. And this kind of joint is uh, commonly used in the ancient construction uh, as to uh, uh, to connect uh, to to extending uh, element like beams, and so it's uh, quite uh, suitable for our Lambo concept. Uh, but uh, uh, the the original geometry of this kind of joint should also be adapted to the uh, uh, cut the the uh, circular saw blade we are using. So as the uh, as the joint the joint uh, the size of the joint will vary uh, diff uh, greatly with the diameter of the elements. So when when the uh, diameter is uh, larger, the uh, it could be uh, cut through by the saw blades. Uh, uh, so uh, we redesign the. Uh, Joints. If the joint, if if the size is uh, uh, larger uh, than actually, if the depth, if the length of this type of this area of this area is uh, larger than the cutting capacity of the saw blades, we will redesign the uh, joints to uh, allow the saw blade to com complete the cutting in multi steps. And uh, then we do the viral positioning of the tree box, uh, uh, which is also a significant challenge. And uh, uh, this research link try to uh, link was a, a very cost efficient and easy accessible uh, camera to uh, deal with the positioning problem. A very uh, cheap web uh, make a uh, pixel camera is uh, uh, mounted on the spindle actually to uh, scan the uh, scan the elements, and uh, uh, then the scan the punk cloud will be uh, matched with the mesh model. Uh, actually, the mesh model will be transformed onto the punk cloud as uh, the punk cloud. Uh, uh, Derived from the scanning process is uh, uh, in the same uh, coordinated system with the uh, uh, robot. So we need to transform the mesh model into the uh, pump cloud to, to uh, localize the uh, where where the component is. Uh, actually, to taking use of the uh, uh, cooperative. Uh, uh, fabrication uh, setup. We could uh, 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 actually in the uh, fabrication process, we will have a lot of uh, problem in uh, planning the passes for uh, the robot to uh, uh, cut the uh, different joints in one uh, uh, in one program. So. Uh, we try to take the collaboration uh, as a solution to this kind of uh, past planning problem. Uh, we try to uh, uh, one uh, the the graving the graving robot will try to move the uh, uh, components inside the reach of the uh, processing robots, and uh, uh, once. Uh, a joint is complete, it will adjust uh, its uh, position uh, to another uh, position that is uh, uh, easier for the robot to fabricate. And uh, uh, based on all the technology we mentioned before, we 
set up this kind of a, a fabrication process. First, uh, the one robot will clamp the robot, and another, and then another robot is uh, 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 will positioning the elements with the camera, and then we generate the uh, two parts we want to fabricate it, and use a uh, few robots to simulate the uh, pass. If the pass is okay, we will fabricate it. If it's not okay, we will adjust the. Uh, position the pose of the robot to make sure that all, uh, the, the two bus is fine. And after that, we use a, a, a UDP a, a connection to send the command to the robots and to start the fabrication. And actually, the fabrication process is quite uh, straightforward due to the very simulated uh, nature of the pro program. Only uh, the operator need to operate uh, the robot and run the program from the uh, host computer. And uh, the, the on-site uh, construction is quite uh, fast. It uh, only takes uh, two days. And uh, this, uh, the final pavilion also serves as a very small gathering space uh, for the cafe uh, nearby. And it's a group photo. It's uh, at the uh, clothing ceremony of this year's so uh, architecture in the future events. And uh, actually, although this is a quite short term project uh, within only two months, and this project uh, allows us to see the potential as well as a challenge using this kind of nature growing tree, trees as uh, construction materials. So, in the future, maybe we uh, it, we can develop more in the area like. Uh, uh, the John Jones aspect and also the robotic uh, fabrication aspect. And uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, all my presentation today. Thank you all for the watching. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Shafa. So, so raw material, raw wood and its robotic fabrication workflow is indeed an emerging research field and it's fascinating to see your perspective on it. And as you mentioned, some of our panelists who also actually engage in this field, so I'm sure our coming discussion will be uh, quite engaging. And now let's move forward to our uh, next uh, final keynote speaker today. So welcome Professor Tom Civilian, who will share his expertise on digital timber practice. So Professor Tom, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Yes. Great. Is that okay? Everybody see that? Yeah. Yes, we can see. It. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, really happy to um, to to share my work with you. Um, uh, also, thanks for the previous presentation. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry I missed the first one, but uh, it was it's great to see the the work that is happening in uh, in in tim intelligent timber construction. Um, I will present today uh, something that um, uh, we call a digital timber practice, um, and it is, I guess, my um, in, in my experience or in my view anyway, um, when we think about uh, robotic timber fabrication or digital timber fabrication, um, for me, uh, the digital fabrication is kind of one cornerstone of a practice that actually also involves the um, how we model or represent or how do we seek and, and acquire information about uh, the material itself and how we use it in construction. And then, you know, another pillar being how we actually implement it in, in, in design um, and design practice. Um, so I wanted to sort of um, uh, trace this kind of um, series of projects and experiments uh, from a while back until what we are doing today um, with a big focus on um, material properties and, and performance and behaviors um, through simulation and modeling. Uh, so just uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm Tom Svillens. I'm an assistant professor at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Um, I did my PhD some time ago uh, as part of the EU Horizon 2020 Interchain Network um, at uh, the Center for IT and Architecture at the Academy. Um, and the premise of uh, Interchain was, uh, was the challenging of the linearity of the digital design chain and how we could introduce um, things like recursion and iteration and alternative strategies there. Um, and more recently, um, currently, uh, my focus in research has been on the European Research Council funded Eco-metabolistic architecture project in CETA. 
Um, so I'll be speaking about that um, later on, uh, but is that's the that's the current um, current uh, project that we are busy with. Um, and more generally, uh, I focus on the timber value chain digitization across various parts of the digital or uh, various parts of the timber value chain, um, computational modeling and, uh, and digital fabrication. And outside of academia, of course, I'm also a design consultant for uh, typically for computational modeling of timber structures. Um, so my background is this. I'm trained as an architect. Um, my interest uh, kind of in this part of the field uh, began with with uh, with what we see on the left, which was um, an, an experiment with, uh, with robotically adjusted uh, laminated timber that was responding to um, to sensors, which you don't see in the picture on the ceiling, and trying to match the form in reality of of, of the lamellas with uh, with the simulated um, with the simulated output. So there was a simulation that was simulating the bending of this material. There were sensors that were um, telling us the real bending of the material, and the robot was trying to kind of close that gap between the two. And on the right is just my experience in uh, also working as technical director for a 3D scanning firm, uh, where we explored that as a medium um, and tried to integrate that into uh, you know, spatial, uh, not only architectural, but generally spatial uh, projects and, and installations and things like that. As you can see, it's from a long time ago because we had to make our own trackers for the Oculus, whereas these days, all of that is included. Uh, so to those of you that aren't familiar with the Center for IT and Architecture, uh, we are part of the um, Institute of Building Technology in, at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen. Uh, it was founded uh, approximately 15 years ago. Um, and broadly, the, uh, the, the broad research question of CETA is how does digital culture impact practices of designing and materializing architecture? So basically, what is the intersection between digital, you know, in, in, in its entirety and the way we design, represent and make buildings and you know, things in general. Yeah. Um, and CETA is very active through dissem dissemination, uh, participating in organizing events. Um, we're very friendly and we collaborate a lot. Um, we're, we're you know, happy to be part of um, the network within this field and, and collaborate a lot with the partners in Europe, in the States, in Asia, all over the world uh, through various uh, uh, shared projects and other um, yeah, uh, forums. Um, and I think quite importantly, especially for this discussion, is that uh, one of the main methods through which CETA um, creates knowledge is through um, through hands-on material production. Uh, and therefore, we, um, we, uh, we, we test our research and we really focus on, as the previous speakers have as well demonstrated, uh, we test our research through, uh, through prototyping and, and demonstrators. Um, so I will start with this idea of, uh, of an integrated material practice in freeform timber structures um, and what that means. Um, and to kind of rewind even further back from that, um, something that all of us no doubt already understand is uh, when it comes to using wooden construction, we are presented with uh, with challenges. You know, so what are the what are the problems with wood? Um, first one being that as a biological material, it has very uh, distinct uh, lifespan or life cycle. You know, it grows, it matures, it dies, it decays, um, and everything we do. Um, uh, to use it in construction is about delaying that moment between, you know, the cutting of a tree and its inevitable decay. So delaying that moment as long as possible to uh, to to make use of that uh, timber. Um, and also due to its biological origins, um, it is a very heterogeneous material. So as you can see from these CT scan slices on the right, no no two slices are the same. Everywhere the material is different, and this is because of the presence of knots of um, of different, you know events throughout the growth cycle of a tree, uh, just differentiations between the heartwood and the sapwood, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as, as, result of, as a result of this as well, um, uh, wood has a high directionality, which is something that affects um, almost every single property of wood um, that, we, um, that is relevant for uh, fabrication and construction. So the anisotropy of wood is a primary um, challenge to confront when we are dealing with wood. Um, where I started to get uh, very interested in, in is, is in how trees themselves are uh, in very many ways self-optimizing structures. Um, and if you look at things like branching and how the fiber topology changes around these kind of vortices of, of, of um, you know, of, of branchings in the tree, um, the topology of the fibers uh, becomes very interesting. And, um, and that's, uh, that's kind of, a, you know, an evolved mechanism in trees to resist loads and, um, and gravity and wind and things like that. Um, and I think we can learn from that. So um, uh, Klaus Mathik said that the growth of trees is the axiom of uniform stress realized as an average over time. 
um, meaning that given these force inputs on a tree, it will allocate growth strategically um, to optimize its form towards those uh, external forces. Um, and that's how, for example, we get reaction within sort of strange trees like this. Um, this has obviously been, you know, that's nothing new. Uh, this has been explored in, in, in depth um, uh, as we saw in the previous presentation, also by our friends at, uh, at Hook Park, uh, who also uh, pursued a similar um, line of questioning. Um, other practices such as bow botanic that try to integrate living trees into their constructions and, and, and dealing with the long time spans of growth. Um, but the reality is when we get to um, industrial production, um, then this is often what we're confronted with. So all that kind of specificity and complexity of a tree is, um, is standardized into rectangles. And then we complain about knots and other kind of perceived defects. You know, there's an irony in there. Um, and of course, obviously the standardization and the industrialization of timber has given us many interesting and useful products to play with, such as glue lamb on the left, you know, cross laminated timber and combining those with multi-axis machining um, gives us, you know, incredible possibilities for things to do uh, with timber and the whole arsenal of timber products. So in my research, I, I began with by, uh, by looking, uh, by really zooming in on this interesting object that kind of um, that uh, that was representative of all this, which was the Gulam blank. So the, the sort of unfinished piece in between the raw material and, and the final product. Um, and again, just to give a bit more sort of pedagogical background information, you know, we have different types of Gulam blanks. And so they did have different requirements um, and they have, uh, they have different characteristics. For example, a straight Gulam blank requires very minimal processing. Um, but if you're cutting freeform geometry out of it, uh, you end up with a lot of waste and a lot of strength reductions due to cutting across the fibers of the wood. So because of, again, the anisotropic effects or diff uh, characters of, uh, of the strength properties of wood, um, there's uh, uh, that leads to potential problems. On the other hand, at the other end of the scale, um, a double curved glue lamp where the fibers follow the beam is very strong, but the complexity explodes in production. As we can see on the right, this is a um, highly double curved glue lamb beam or the end part of it. And as you can see, the, the, the sheer amount of components um, to handle, to assemble, to, to manage uh, logistically uh, in the factory is, uh, is, is, is enormous. So to kind of summarize this sort of background um, snapshot of, of where we are in timber, um, often when we are, uh, often when we talk about woodcraft, we are, we might have these romantic notions of a craftsperson in a wood workshop um, working hands directly on the material at a small scale with, with hand tools. But the reality is that um, there are other notions of digital woodcraft and, and craftsmanship that um, exist today that are located in this bottom um, uh, area, you know, the, the industrial context you know, of scale, of machines, of operating close to the material, but at a distance. So through the vehicle of sensors, of, um, of models of, of information technology and very importantly in collaboration with teams. So it's no longer a single individual with their hands directly on the material, but teams of experts operating through various means around a material. So there's different conceptions of, of craftsmanship that come up. Um, and then of course we can characterize the modern timber industry as being one that's predicated on prefabrication, automation, information technology, robotics, for example and uh, structural adhesives that uh, make everything happen. So the work involved in this, um, in, in this research was to try to find this, um, how, you know, what, would a, what would be the character of a design practice or a material practice that dealt specifically with freeform timber architecture in this kind of industrial context, you know, given the tools we have. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, it was about trying to pull back the remit of, of, of design, um, from just using a material or a product to also kind of pulling a bit back and, and, and investigating more closely what happens in the manufacture of these products and how that knowledge can be leveraged for the benefit of design. And as I mentioned before, then that, that put the focus really on this middle piece, the glue lamb blank. It's between sawn lumber and before, uh, between sawn lumber and the finished glue lamb component. So it's this kind of semi finished piece that is still very much aligned with the final component yet very much removed from, um, yet very specific, um, yet, sorry, yet not entirely um, uh, resolved yet. Yeah. Um, and this was basically the uh, the series of, uh, this was the map of, of projects and the kind of pillars that I was mentioning in the beginning 
uh, that formed around this, uh, that kind of formed together to, to create this material practice. So on the one hand, there was the question of how do we model uh, wood in general, and then how do we model freeform components? And from there, going in two directions, so going zooming out, um, how do we manage complexity when we have thousands of unique elements and each of them have unique production requirements? And then zooming in, um, what does that mean for, for these kind of complex aggregates of laminated timber, especially when they start to become non-standard? Yeah. So this diagram on the, on the right kind of um, sketches that out um, and sh shows the kind of multi-scale modeling approach there. So yeah, on the one hand, there was the modeling. How do we represent? How do we draw these things? On the, on the other hand, it was how do we wrestle with this materialization? How do we really engage with the digital fabrication of timber? What can we offer there? What are the challenges? And then finally, um, the third pillar being um, how is that integrated into design? So given these two other pillars, modeling, materializing, how can we actually transfer that into a design practice? And between the three um, pillars, that's how the digital practice is formed. So in terms of modeling, um, there was a lot of... Um, uh, investigation in, in you know how to represent heterogeneity, uh, for example, in in discretizing you know models and and uh, looking at how how actually material properties might change around these kind of um, you know, very isolated or very localized disruptions in fiber direction such as knots. Uh, then there were elements of how how do we consider both on an element scale the orientation of a cross section and how an element is modeled. But at the same time, keeping track of its constitu constituent parts, the lamellas that make up the beam, and their even even their local material orientations. Yeah. So how do we kind of connect those two scales? And then finally, there was this issue of how do we represent some of these properties on our design geometry? So again, these are also diagrams that represent blanks with the red outlines and then the element geometries, and coming up with ways to get uh, visual feedback for. Um, for the consequences of our decisions. For example, in this image, um, cutting complex piece out of a straight blank yields a lot of red areas where there's a lot of cutting across the fibers and great reductions in strength. Whereas using a double curved blue lamp blank, more difficult to produce, um, yields a much better alignment between the fiber um, directions and, and the surfaces that are milled from, uh, from the blank. Yeah. That eventually all um, was coalesced into uh, to, uh, a toolkit uh, called Glulam, which is also uh, a plugin for Grasshopper, as well as just an API for to, to speed up the, um, the modeling of uh, complex timber structures and joints, and has been uh, used in several projects since. Um, yes, so just some imagery from some of the development and some of the kind of um, uh, uses of that toolkit. Um, and then shifting our eyes to um, to the materialization of of these uh, of these complex glue limb objects, this be this began very intuitively and haptically. And and here I was basing initially, uh, or I was kind of uh, inspired initially by the some um, alternative patents by Otto Hetzer. So as you know, Otto Hetzer was the, the father of glue lamb. They say um, he uh, greatly popularized this method of laminating gluing wood together in in, in curves. Um, to achieve you know, larger and, and stiffer beams by aggregating small lamellas. But he also had some interesting ideas about how he might use the fiber direction and the kind of tailored inter interior um, fiber direction of these laminated composites to, uh, to kind of optimize them for particular um, situations. For example, if you can see in this bottom diagram here in the first image, um, there is in this composite, there is a, there's a bent piece of wood that is following you know, the main axes of, of forces on this beam um, and by lining the fibers with the forces, um, it is gaining a much better efficiency in, the, in its uh, performance. And so there were experiments that kind of started these principles of just intuitively thinking, what are alternative ways of constructing glue lamb blanks? There was a question of branching, you know, what if a glue lamb branches, how can we combine um, strategies of cross lamination that we see in CLT um, in intermediate layers to brace these uh, these forks uh, to kind of prevent splitting forces. There were other kind of notions of um, if if we cross laminate joints right into the glue lamp blank, we can uh, we can move the joints to the outside of complex areas and make them simpler to deal with. Um, so the complexity goes in the blank um, instead of the joint. Uh, and then there were other um, little prototypes for particular design situations that were looking at how would the, the constituents of the glue lamp be uh, be arranged to build up something that's much more specific and um, and tailored for a particular design application. 
Of course, this meant that, um, and uh, and we saw this before as well um, in the previous presentation, if you have very complex forms, um, it's not enough just to put them in front of the robot and expect the robot to do something, we need to see them. So what followed was also um, a, a series of experiments that combined 3D scanning with, um, with, uh, with the robotic fabrication um, to be able to yeah, acquire these more and more complex timber composites um, to be able to work with them and kind of analyze what's been made versus what's been modeled. This also translated to a series of experiments in the factory um, that were aimed at uh, integrating this kind of feedback into um, large-scale glue lamp production through various means. So through LiDAR scanning, motion tracking, and self-built uh, laser scanners. Um, and that was kind of helping to address some of these problems that were uh, present also in the, in the industrial production of um, glue lamp beams was uh, this, this a dissonance between the model and, and the material and how we can make those two meet. Um, and then finally, uh, as the final kind of pillar, um, this also evolved into a series of design experiments that were uh, deploying these tools and then and learning about how this kind of complexity that you see on the left can be managed by um, by the appropriate data structures in this, in this case, kind of graph structures that helped us relate um, individual components of a very complex piece and be able to extract specific information from specific areas. Um, so this was a, this was a competition project with a colleague, uh, Paul Poinette at uh, CETA um, and his uh, research on multi-scalar modeling. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, to close off the, um, uh, to close off the, uh, the PhD experiments, um, at the end was a, uh, was a kind of uh, bringing together of all these pieces of uh, experiments into kind of one final um, demonstrator um, to both test the modeling skills and then how these techniques of sensing and integrating scanning into the material aware modeling workflow could be done um, together at a smaller scale uh, with just me. So this is the five axis milling of some of these pieces. This is the kind of evolution of that scanning and, and orientation into the, into the machine developed um, with industry. And then this is the kind of final study piece with the mistakes and everything. So as, uh, as, as this was being done, this is also kind of the testing ground for, for prototyping the process. Um, so as it went, it was improved and challenges were met and overcome. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's the first, um, that's the kind of, um, let's say first chunk of, of, of work that really for me um, brought to brought to life this idea of a, of a material practice around around wood and, and therefore kind of a digital timber practice. And again, that's for me was based on information, modeling, simulating, you know, getting um, deriving information about the material in in the digital model to allow us to make decisions about it. We think some materializing. So probing this kind of fabrication chain and, and the value chain of wood. And then finally, how that gets integrated into design projects. Um, and yeah, and that for me also this, uh, so this, this design practice or this digital wood practice was kind of um, embodied this kind of entanglement with material and industrial processes. Um, and the methodology kind of made these uh, four terms, um, yeah, activated these kind of four terms, which I, I won't get into right now. Um, after this line of um, experiments, um, and also kind of in the, including the general conversation at CETA as well, um, the, the focus has shifted let, um, from one of material and kind of a generic material that sort of appears in our models and our designs uh, to one of resource. So all of a sudden when we talk about resource, um, we talk about a place, where does the resource come from? So origin, how does that resource arrive at its various locations of processing, uh, things like pollution and, and, and ultimately life cycle. Um, and this brings me to the raw lamb experiments, which are now, uh, which we began in 2018 um, and finished a couple of years ago. Um, and they started out looking at digital um, uh, developments in sawmilling and forestry. So this is the command center of, um, of a sawmill up in Sweden. Um, and in terms of this value chain of wood, um, whereas the PhD kind of sought to address the production of, and, and composition of these kind of custom glue laminated composites, uh, the next question was, what if what if this this kind of reach of the design was stretched even further back? So how could we integrate um, even earlier steps in the value chain back to the forest? Yeah, so sawmilling and forestry. And here we also got hooked on these um, these exciting developments in in sawmilling, uh, such as um, uh, CT scanning or computed tomography X-ray scanning of logs in line at the sawmill. 
So logs go through the saws, through the blades every two seconds. Just before they hit the hit the blades, they are uh, CT scanned. And there's given enough time just to adjust the rotation and slight positioning of the log uh, to yield an optimal um, uh, yeah, lumber yield from that log. Yeah. But what this reveals to us is that these data sets are incredibly rich and give us such a more detailed interior uh, view um, that we could exploit for all sorts of other um, purposes. And so by if we could only sort of harness or integrate this data into the design process, um, it would open up many possibilities. So that was the kind of thinking behind that. And just for a reference, this is the this is the kind of the type of scanner that is used. This is not what is used in the sawmill. This is a, a research one and an older one. On the left, you can see the newer one by Microtech. And this is at um, our friend's lab in uh, Lulio Technical University in the Wood Excellence Center, who have been very generous with sharing their, their experience and knowledge with us. Um, but it comes down to this, is from these rich data sets of these kind of interior landscapes of trees, we can start to extract features. So the knot cones become visible, uh, the pith, the center line of the tree becomes visible, um, and other features such as the sap line between the heartwood and the sapwood uh, become uh, kind of uh, actionable. Yeah. So what the Rawlam experiments asked was, how do we use this data set intelligently? Or how can we, how can this start to steer processes of design and decision-making? And the, and the very basic idea um, uh, was to, to ask, well, can we start to allocate particular parts of the log to particular parts of the finished prototype or the beam and, uh, and change it also from not trying to extract the best wood possible in every single place, but find the appropriate qualities of wood for the appropriate parts of the beam, recognizing that any kind of construction element is not performing the same throughout its entire body, right? We don't have the exact the same forces throughout the entirety of, of, of an element. There are concentrations, there are flows. Um, there are parts where, the, where this beam you know, performs more and parts where it performs less. Same in the log, there might be um, parts of the log that are more appropriate or have you know, uh, more suitable mechanical properties than other parts of the log. So the challenge was then, how do we map these two together? And this resulted in a series of experiments that also tried to um, find a place for some of the parts that would otherwise get rejected in, in sawmilling, such as, just to go back, um, or here, um, like some of these interior parts. So all of these kind of side pieces and, and parts of the bark and the wane, um, they would get, um, they would get, you know, down cycled in, in the normal sawmilling process. But for us, this was also an opportunity to kind of challenge the propensity in engineered timber construction for perfectly smooth, not free services. But in our experiments, this, um, it came down to on the ins, for example, in areas such as the interior side, interior web of a beam, where maybe the beam doesn't need to perform as, 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 as highly. Maybe that's where we can find a place for this kind of you know, so-called lower quality wood. And on the right, around joints or areas where we need high, you know, good properties, we use high quality wood. So not free, very even, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of functional grading, uh, but, or, or, but rather kind of a functional mapping between the resource and, and the design element. And then followed a process of scaling this up. So for the final, uh, uh, so we had to kind of develop our uh, lamination infrastructure. We, uh, again, through this kind of very intuitive and haptic uh, approach, we cut our own logs. We would laminate it all and everything together just to understand what goes into this kind of uh, process um, and what, you know, where can we find opportunities? Where do we encounter challenges? And this developed into the final prototype, which was this uh, um, structure here. And this is what I was talking about before. So given a design model and a kind of a mapping of requirements um, and given on the right, a list of boards that are cut from a log, how do we start to match what we see on the left what we see on the, with what we see on the right? And recognizing that each frame is divided into a number of beams, each beam has a bunch of different lamellas and then each board, you know, each of those lamellas needs to find its place on one board. So there's then a bit of kind of data management gymnastics to kind of allocate these lamella throughout the log in, uh, in, in a way that best somehow responds to, um, to the performance requirements of the, of the design model. Yeah. So in this image here, the red is where the material quality needs to be high and the green is where the material quality is allowed to be low. And here are just some images of, um, of the process. So for, again, this is, again, for us, this was a way to scale up and uh, just, um, 
just kind of solidify this workflow or this approach. And this is one part of it in Aarhus. There's some of the participants as well. And then it ended up in um, in an exhibition up in uh, Umeå in Sweden. So again, um, for me, I find this uh, I find this kind of possibility for expressing more of the origin of the tree very interesting. So how does the bark? How can that be a more of a player? Here it's done, you know, more from a performance point of view. But you can also imagine that being used very figuratively and expressively in, in a bunch of different ways. So we see a lot of potential in, in alternate ways of using. You know, these types of developments in forestry and sonway. Yeah, this project I wanted to put in because it also shows a different type of context for uh, for what I think of as this digital uh, timber practice. Um, this was done in a professional team that was actually very dislocated. So everybody on this list was in a different company, and most of us were in different countries. And it was done on a very short time frame, uh, and it involved academia and and industrial partners. So it was a small exhibition project. Uh, by Helen and Hard Architects in Norway, and then through the network of kind of friends and, and 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 people who know each other, this team was brought together. So it was a very, I think, one of the um, interesting parts about this project was the kind of informality of the team, but as a result, how agilely and how involved everybody could move, or how agilely we could move, and how involved we could all be in the discussions around the project, which meant that every um, every, all the decision making happened kind of in plenum with all the partners involved. So that allowed very fast coordination and resolution of things from all different sides. Um, so that was a tight integration of, for example, the fabricator and the design team and everybody in between. Um, it was made out of um, out of uh, flooring offcuts. So Douglas for flooring, um, yeah, cutoffs uh, that were donated. And then assembled into these segmented beams, um, and all the woods. Uh, so the, the main structure has no uh, metal joints. Um, everything is done with dowels and, um, and integral joints. So you can see from these finished blanks here um, the process for uh, for making them. So each of these segments is cut from an individual small offcut from flooring. Then they are assembled into these blanks. You know another way of sort of a custom composite of of a glue laminated element. Um, and then the final surfaces and joints are machined out of those. So here you see, for example, Morton in his workshop, um, uh, keeping an eye on the production of some of the elements here. Um, and yeah, I think the what I what I wanted to stress in this project was just that um, it was only really possible through a very very close collaboration between you know myself as responsible responsible for the modeling and the fabrication model, um, and Morton the fabricator, right? So. There was a lot of there was this very close communication. It was there was never a case of having a bunch of data and handing it off to um, somebody to make it. Um, there was a constant dialogue, even down to, for example, the connector plates. So there you can see the you know the the model being kind of present while everything is being made and while everything is being checked. Um, so not only the technical aspects of you know making the right information for um the fabrication is important but also these kind of more social or organizational aspects are um, are are just as important and just to give you an overview um this is again kind of building on some of the tools developed in my phd to to make this uh this kind of very comprehensive model of the structure on the left here you see the uh, the structure for scale and then each of these are elements at the top and then under each element there are all the individual components uh required to uh, to make the blanks um, and then of course all the joint geometry, all the plates, every single dowel. Um, so this also shows maybe sometimes the risk of, uh, of this kind of highly digital uh, way of working, which is the, um, the comprehensiveness or the necessary thoroughness of information that is required to, uh, to make these things work. Uh, because nothing can be done on site here. Everything has to be kind of prefabricated so that everything can be sure to be fit. Um, so everything can be kind of accurately cut because everything, every joint is different. Every, every geometry varies just slightly. Um, so I think for all the possibilities and benefits that come from uh, these techniques, it also comes with a kind of a warning and a more of an involvement. But again, coming back to the kind of organizational aspect of this project, it was just through the, the tightness of the team or the kind of very open and integrated communication um, that this could be developed in, uh, in such a, a short amount of time. And like I mentioned before, these kind of this information flow uh, for me is I think is just as important as the actual production of the object. So 
what ends what what's what is actually a you know a, quite an abstract web of relationships between blanks elements joints things like that in the end comes down to this which i think is my favorite moment which is when the plate just gets slotted in it fits it gets doweled in and that's it so this kind of background and information that allows that kind of production to happen i think is um, is, is very interesting um and then just to kind of um, also show that um some of this thinking has also been explored by uh, some of our students in in, uh, in, in teaching. So, for example, uh, the work of UAN um, looked at kind of similar ideas of uh, information modeling for uh, for reclaimed timber elements and how those could be reconfigured into um, new types of constructions. Yeah, um, there's a there's a big focus at um, at CETA also for uh, for 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 getting into uh, reclaimed timber as a resource. Um, we saw again earlier. Um, fallen trees or trees that are otherwise unsuitable for sawmilling being used in, in, in production. But there's also the rise of, um, of using construction waste or cutoffs, for example, like in the previous project, um, as, as, as a potential resource, um, especially as we want to limit the amount of impact we have on our forests. So that's becoming interesting. Um, and then aspects such as reconfiguration, design for manufacturer assembly, parametric systems, timber information modeling, as I've been talking about, and then of course robotic fabrication. Um, another uh, older student project by by Ethan Chu also looked at reconfiguration and how joints could be kind of uh, reinterpreted for another life, or give allow the building to kind of completely transform um, through these kind of very malleable um, joint objects, which then could be remachined and kind of reconfigured in different ways um, to to take on a new life and therefore extend. The, uh, the lifespan of buildings. So just to, to give a little snapshot also how this kind of uh, timber thinking is also coming out from, um, from, from very interesting um, uh, projects in, in our teaching. Yes. Oops. Good. And then I would just wanted to end on uh, what we are doing today. So this eco-metabolistic architecture project. Um, the uh, EMA uh, project is uh, is very much to do with um, with the kind of biological or bio based shift in construction. So the shift uh, towards a bio based economy of construction. Um, and one of the challenges, as as we've seen, is uh, biological materials have an innate sort of temporality and life cycle that needs to be addressed, as well as a heterogeneity. But of course, every you know there are many biological materials, and there are many different expressions of these two things. Um, so there are several different material tracks. In the EMA project, uh, this is the timber track, the biopolymer track, so 3D printed recipes of, um, of, uh, of biopolymers, as well as living materials and, and bacteria. Uh, these other two tracks are also present in and around the work of CETA, but not directly related to the eco-metabolistic architecture project. So in, in our current work in the, um, in the timber track, um, what we are really zooming in on is how do we generate models to predict the performance and behavior of uh, composite timber elements. Um, so if we are confident that we can shape and, and machine all sorts of forms out of our wood um, resource, um, then the next thing to do is to look at how, how do we actually know what the wood will be doing when it is machined, when it is in service, and, and how can we start to predict um, its eventual performance uh, before we even, uh, before we make it. Um, and this is also uh, related to efforts or yeah, thinking in how do we reconsider timber construction as being kind of a one-off um, to something that is kind of adapted or can again, take on more, uh, more lives in the future to be reassembled into something else. Or how can something be reconfigured um, to extend its life, lifespan? And that's all, of course, that's also kind of uh, tied to issues of, uh, or concepts of maintenance uh, and replacement. Um, so this is where we're really digging in, uh, and this is also where we've uh, we've uh, been happy to collaborate and, and and draw from the knowledge and experience at, uh, at friends at, uh, for example, TU Vienna and Computational Mechanics, um, and and the Wood Department in uh, LTU and Lulio Technical University, um, and and start to develop a more thorough and powerful material model for timber that we can then use to approximate better or yeah, better simulate the actual effects of, uh, or the actual behaviors of timber under certain conditions. Uh, so for example, a big one is how to simulate the knot uh, uh, fiber flows and directions around knot cones, right? 
Um, the other thing is how to extract from these CT scan data sets, how to, how to take out more precise material orientations that could then be fed into our uh, simulation models. Um, a lot of them are based on, on, on very, um, you know, very thorough precedents. Um, for us, again, as, uh, as, as, uh, as I've mentioned before, the, um, what we are trying to do is then to integrate and implement a lot of these and to try to tie, pull all these kind of, you know, try to find these different models that are, are out there um, that look at very specific, you know, features and, and phenomena in wood and try to kind of somehow pull them together um, and, and, and activate them for design and use them for design. Um, so this is, again, another experiment of also thinking about, well, the lamella doesn't have to be a rectangular board. All of a sudden, if we can if we can cut all sorts of shapes out of it, we can start to be much more specific about how our material orientations um, are expressed in the final laminated component, right? So it's a kind of liberating the, the lamella from its rectangular form and uh, allowing it to be um, uh, more, yeah, more arbitrary. And this is also tied with also current uh, attempts to see how we could start to um, look at it kind of generatively, you know, given given some sort of field of forces and fiber flows, um, are there intelligent ways of segmenting a volume of a component into discrete things that we could then produce individually and then laminate together that better respond um, in their internal fiber orientation composition to the loads that are put on them? Um, and then this is a shot of how that um, you know, the, uh, yeah, this kind of allocation between the, the material and the log, which you see on the top, and how those material properties and how those, uh, how that information then is transferred also into the design model into very specific locations. So we start to have a very precise um, linking between what is exactly what is happening in the design model and exactly where that is coming from in the log. And that goes through to, um, and uh, yeah, one of the things I've just uh, presented, uh, um, at a conference uh, here is, um, has been this uh, mostly open source tool chain between the design modeling and, and the uh, quite detailed um, FEA modeling of, um, of mechanical performance in these composites, um, leveraging this um, CT scan, uh, these CT scan data sets of logs and how we extract uh, information out of them. So it comes down to this. So how do we, how can we connect to design models and, and actually simulate their performance more accurately by knowing which specific resource they are being drawn from. Um, and there are some recent uh, prototypes for how some of these elements could look. Here we are experimenting as well with how do we, can we cut out more complex lamella and then glue them together and still have, um, you know, accuracy in joints and things like that. You know, it's proving to be very difficult. That's okay. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of where we are at the moment. This is um, what we are trying to do is kind of, again, map this kind of the, the model and the simulation in the virtual wood or the digital wood onto the actual material and, and link the specific material resource with the specific design. Um, and I think that's probably the appropriate way to sum it up. So I'll leave it there. Of course, there are many challenges. Um, as soon as you introduce such a specificity where this element has to come from this tree and if this element is lost, then you have a very difficult situation, which is again, an argument for standardization Standardization implies interchangeability. So that is also kind of a wider question, I think, for anything that that is uh, specific uh, to overcome. Um, but yeah, this is a work in progress. We are still very actively looking at these questions. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for paying attention. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Tom. This is a brilliant presentation for illustrating timber material and its uh, computational calculation strategy, I think. It is time to for our to for, for us to move to the next part for our panelists who have diverse experience and expertise in timber construction. And firstly, we want to, I want to invite you, Dr. Yanxi. I believe you are a master of digital timber design and optimization. And do you have any idea you want to share with us from your perspective? Yeah, yes. Thanks. Thanks for the botanist's presentation and the. All, uh, all of them uh, inspired me very much. And maybe I have some questions about the, the, the presentation. Uh, firstly, maybe for the uh, Dr. Petros, uh, you have mentioned many uh, projects about using the uh, plant materials. And as at, and, uh, at last, uh, you mentioned, you also mentioned that you have um, some projects uh, using the raw 
wooden materials. So, uh, I just wondering, what's the most uh difference uh, or between using these two types of uh materials? The question is is, is, uh, is that uh, between the, the raw materials and uh, and uh, those plates more homogenized materials. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so when we coming from, okay, I will try to rotate this question uh, like this. <clears throat> Is uh, like if you forget all this research, like in academic environments, and if you just take uh, an architect from like not a research, and if you ask him to design a building, it, it's uh, we we had a lot of cases when, for instance, companies comes you know to to Ibo. And, and ask, do you know a student who can draw details, for instance, do you know how to draw a, a timber building? And just this kind of thinking, it's really missing. And I was recently also like searching, is there any like manuals or instructions or tutorials, not in the research way, but just a standard to how to build a timber building. And there's not so many, and, and you see a lot of fancy geometries and so on. And in that cases, it's the easiest ways to use the standardized timber, you know, timber plates, uh, wool and beams and so on. That's very clear answer. If if then you are in the research and you are able to actually capture like or calculate structurally how those more regular timbers uh, works, then you have this leverage of freedom to to, to play with this. So for instance, at Tibor there was uh, there was two types of Tibor, like the current one, and there was a previous professor who already died. Uh, um, and, and they already investigated actually cutting trees, uh, doing like structural performance tests, like in bending, compression, all, all this. And they get more or less the value than the safety, you know, in, in like for, for timbers, like always 1.5, 1.6. And, and you kind of leverage with this. But you always need to calibrate your, your structural models. And for instance, in iron, even you have a LVL panels, every single connection had to be really tested to get approximate value. So it's not a uniform materials you, you, you need to calibrate. If not, then you have to, yeah, you, you have to do the, the structural tests. And I was also speaking with Fast and F, like this uh, huge Canadian office, I think, from Silence is, is more aware of this. But they also have a concept lab. Like every project they have, they also try to test the, uh, you know, the, the structural materials before before it comes in construction. So it's it's not it's not uniform material, and and it's not like concrete or steel that you can get the values like one number. You have to test it full, and then that that's a little. And it's not only geometry. You have to really work with, work with engineers, architects. And it becomes tangled and interesting. I think and this is what Thomas was also was explaining that. Uh, you need to deal with a lot of people and infrastructure to get the project full, because there are other things in, in the chain. Yeah. So it's not an easy answer. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So maybe there is another similar question for the uh, Professor Tom. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Doctor Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the the next question is about uh, for the Professor Tom. Uh, you mentioned that um, you do many research about the fiber direction in in the materials and uh, do the double curved uh, component. Uh, so. You also mentioned there are many uh, hard wooden cores inside the wooden materials. So I just wondering, how did you deal with the hard cores inside the real wooden materials? Yeah. You mean the knots? Is that what you mean? Like the yeah. like the knot? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So because those are um, those present problems with a particular intention. Um, because they have these, you know, they have very dramatic changes in, in the wood direction, so uh, you lose a lot of strength around them. So um, the trick is you can, and you can't avoid them because there's so many of them in a log. No? Um, and also it doesn't make sense to cut it, such small pieces out just to kind of avoid knots. Um, but the way it also, um, the way it works also just in normal glue lamp production is by evening out where they are. 
you largely you can kind of like amortize the effect that they have on the overall performance of the beam by spreading them out throughout the beam. And this is in in a similar way, I guess, to what we do is by um, in areas where the beam does need to work as hard, we would try to place more knots. It's not always possible, but it's uh, but it's uh, it helps. Um, yeah. So by basically by putting in areas of the structure where uh, where that that won't be intention or that will be as as minimally affected by by the presence of a knot as possible, if possible. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the answer. And yeah, and and the last uh, question is for the Dr. Chai. I, I just wondering in your the the prefabrication uh project, the second project. Uh, you mentioned that you have some algorithm about aligning the X model to the pre-designed surface. So is there any details available for that? Thank you. Actually, it's a, yeah, this project is developed in uh, quite short term. So the algorithm is a, a mainly a searching algorithm. Right? Uh, we, we have like four different parameter, the length of the element, the uh, cross section, and also the, the angle of the, uh, the, the branch. And uh, what's the last one? It's just that we uh, have the four parameter and we give each parameter and a weight in the in the system and we evaluate how this uh, 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 how each component is uh, uh, compatible with the uh, design the axis and uh, we actually we select the the best based one and uh, actually we, we we don't have a uh uh like a composite uh uh searching algorithm we just uh, search from the uh from the uh button to the top and we we uh, if if one element is selected to use to to be used in in the button then it will be removed to in the library, and then another we we search another one for for the second month. Yeah, it's uh, pretty much a very simple algorithm. Uh, okay, and uh, I understand. Thank you, thank you. So, so okay, so 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 thank you, Dr. Yang and Alex, and you. You have great experience in AR augmented timber fabrication in Cornell and MIT, and we want to uh, share your insights with us. And maybe you can talk about any difference you find of the whole timber in industry in America, Europe, and Asia. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I think it was great seeing all the a wide range of projects. I guess my question could apply to like maybe all three of the keynote speakers. I think. I saw like a wide range of projects working with standard and natural material to create optimized and expressive geometries. And this often results in mass customization and non-standard parts. And I know uh, each of the project tackled this differently through digital fabrication and automation. But I also noticed in some of the photos, there's a lot of human labor that's involved in these automated processes. And I, the question is, how do you guys envision the future of digital systems? Do you guys envision a complete automation or human in the loop processes? And if so, what kind of human in the loop processes would be beneficial in the sense or would a complete automation robotic system be what you guys are aiming towards or what do you think the industry should be aiming towards? I think I think anybody who's worked with a robot would not trust one to be everything automatically. Um, I mean that's that's half a joke, but it's kind of serious as well. I mean, I, I from my side, I would I would I think there would always be a space for um, uh, you know at, definitely at least human oversight you know, or or steering. Um, I think I think what we want to be careful of is 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 losing the using the human hand in 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 this because that you know. I'm trained as a designer. I'm. I still think there's there's a lot there's a big potential and and benefit for 
for having that kind of experience in there. And also there's just some things that are kind of, you know, maybe too much of hassle to automate. You know, sometimes there might be a part of the process that it literally might be faster and simpler to, um, you know, hire a worker to, uh, to, to do it. Um, or, you know, get a craftsman into kind of particularly solve a particularly tricky part. So I, I think there's, um, maybe it's a kind of like, a, you know, on the fence answer, but I think there's a, there's a middle road between them. I think there will always be a place for, for the human in the loop. So, yeah, yeah. I think it, it, the good answer would be also that if, if you would visit like timber companies, which is always a healthy way to, to do it and to see actually how, how they work not academics so it's, um, they also are advanced like you see all these CNC machines robots and so on but there's so, so much actual manual work that they just felt part of the process and I really enjoyed uh, once we had an intern who was not architect not engineer but uh, but uh, you know the timber uh, craftsman essentially who, who is like you know there are people who actually study timber uh, uh, as their education so you know, car carpenters essentially and and we are always uh, like uh, arguing. No, we can do this with CNC. No, we can do it manually. <laughs> and actually, it's not necessarily faster to, to do it by hand or to do it by CNC. So it depends. But what I really like and what is always the most difficult thing is actually going to not the automation but to the concept stage. What actually you want to do? And and sometimes the carpenters have more more ideas. Sometimes architects have more ideas how to actually connect things together. And this is the most interesting part is the, the getting the idea and sketch through and the rest of the process somehow money wise or opportunity wise gets in, in one way to, to, to another. But if the idea is wrong, if the start of the thinking is wrong, then it's the question, do, do you need to invest all of this, this time in, in this? Yeah. I would just completely uh, agree with that just because, um, I mean, it, it just brings to mind previous experiences that I've had in, in a similar way where if if we didn't have that voice in the kind of the beginning of the production planning and, and design, you know, just kind of strategizing how are we going to make this, um, there would have been like so much more, so much more work involved in kind of getting it done. But having those insights kind of very early on, you know, allowed us to simplify and draw from other people's experiences. Exactly what the question said. So I, I'm I'm definitely voting for that as well. Yeah, actually, from an uh, aspect aspect of uh, architects. All uh, in in the university that we is uh, our university that we want to explore more uh, the quality of uh, uh, timber structures. We actually never thought about the uh, uh, automation of the fabrication process. We what we are thinking about is actually the offset. We uh, and not offset. We want to use uh, uh, the uh, capacity of the uh, new tools like robots or like uh, CNC uh, uh, to uh, inspire our new thinking of the how the structure could be in the future. How uh, would it be more efficient? And uh, uh, but uh, I think that if the process could be. Uh, if one construction system could be more sophisticated, it can be some production system that is uh, customized for this kind of uh, system, and it is, and uh, uh, it, this can uh, the system can also be uh, promoted to into the market, and and that that's uh, when we uh, talk when we will. Uh, care more about the automation, but I think that's going to be uh, how and we a, a researcher or an architect will uh, think uh, that's not the way we will uh, uh, think about the, uh, the, the the future of the uh, in the uh, structures of the timber system. Thank you. It's certainly a good discussion about the automation and the, the whole timber market. And Jiayi, since you are also in Denmark and have a great background in structure design and analysis, 
and I know you are interested in conversion blade and disassembly process. So I believe you have you can provide some ideas and raise some questions in your perspective. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for your sharing. Uh, my name is Jiayi. Right now, I'm a PhD student at uh, Aarhus University, Denmark. Yes. And my first question I would like to ask uh, for Dr. Petrias. Hi. Uh, I'm very interested. Oh, I have an engineering background, and I'm very interested in your uh, design for connection. So as we all know, the connection for timber elements are the most important things. Like um, before, we can expand uh, its application. So from your research, I saw that almost all timber connections you designed um, are assembled by wood material itself. There's um, don't have uh, too much steel or other materials. So uh, I'm curious that have you ever disassemble your structure? Like, um, so if you disassemble those elements, um, what happens? And uh, does those timber elements can keep in a safe situation to be reused again? So, so, the, um, so, so the reason why it was uh, this idea of the timber joints was like a philosophy that that lasted for many years. And it, it's what we wanted to do. It's, it's the mindset, you know, it's not necessarily the, more, the best way but it's the way we wanted to approach. Um, but uh, but regarding disassemblability, and, and there was always this thing about you can you know, insert and disassemble. Ideally, yes. And for instance, you, you saw the snapper joints that can be, you know, maybe they are not strong, but they can be squeezed and can be disassembled. But there's another thing that engineers are saying yes, but laughing a little bit. Like the moment you, you assemble uh, the joint, it can, it, it will change a little bit the shape because of humidity and so on and it, it, it deforms you know and uh, at this point it can be a bit, bit tricky but but then it also also depends on, on the project like uh, there was never a goal for us to, to disassemble anything uh, it was always to assemble to build because there are not a lot of building projects so this assemblability was um, the only thing I, I would see is that the moment there was, for instance, N Nicholas thesis from 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 Ibo, when he was trying to assemble timber plates for the robots, that also poses a lot of challenges. It was more mm -hmm. more trying to see what kind of insertion vectors uh, there are. But what no, there was to be honest, there was never a case where when we tried to disassemble. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no Maybe. <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Chai. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your sharing. Um, I noticed that you, uh, in in some project, you used uh, you mentioned that almost more than fifty percent, uh, from tree, uh, those are waste materials. So because we. We take the materials from nature, from tree, and we also need to pay pay uh, attention how we process those waste materials. So um, it's very uh, glad to see that uh, you pay attention to those um, tree forks. That uh, how can we use those parts into a new project? So from your opinion, I would like to ask: um, Is that possible to use those uh, waste, uh, not waste material, those low level? Uh, materials in a real structure like uh, is that possible to replace um, the the trunks the tree trunks uh, actually uh, I, I, I that's not a very further into this aspect but uh, uh, yeah. in my opinion uh, uh, the uh, the so-called uh, uh, I I noticed that there have already been some uh, uh, new startup company who uh, trying to use some um, the uh, small diameter uh, logs or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, try to uh, uh, develop some uh, 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 building system like a a, a, a slab or a, a truss. With uh, uh, small small uh, diameter logs, which is uh, uh, traditionally built as very 
a with, with very low low values but mm -hmm. i think that's a good sign uh, and also and uh, uh and uh, actually in the uh, the low value uh, elements it's a uh, uh, limited uh, in construction industry. I think it's mainly because uh, the uh, building codes is uh, especially I, I don't quite familiar the code in Europe or in other areas, but in China, when you want to build with uh, uh, timber, uh, you need to uh, if you want to use it as a, a structure element, you need to uh, uh, Guarantee that uh, the uh, diameter of the structure element could uh, 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 withstand the fire uh, for at least uh, uh, one hour or something like this, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's why the timber structure in China always appear like very large uh, elements, and uh, I think that. Uh, 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 maybe uh, Tadris and Tom may sh could share more about uh, what uh, the code is like, like in Europe. But, uh, I think with uh, uh, I, I also get to know that the code and, uh, is also developing in China. Maybe in, in the future, it could be possible to use uh, the uh, uh, like the, the uh, logs or uh, the recycled timber in other in, in some very lightweight uh, constructions or uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, decoration part uh, of the uh, I think the, the, there is a lot. I mean, it's not so popping out uh, everywhere, but but it's more like you can see more standardized. Uh, like like for instance in Switzerland, there was a, a, a school built with a rounded log. You don't see it because one side is just cut flat, and then there's thick slab. Um, I, I found also many references. Also, this project that I showed is, is actually going to be built, and, and there is so also. I mean, it's not only like these kind of fancy things. It's just the cheap material that essentially is sold by sustainability. But also, if you think it's two hundred euros per cubic meter. It's cheaper than the other materials, but it has lower value. So then you need to use them where you, it's possible to use if there's such an opportunity. But I think that the key thing is that when when those um, factories, like the, there's one that uh, we collaborated in, in Belgium in Max Prodi, they use already for already used for many buildings, uh, cutting with the ABV robots and cracks, long blocks. There's also one startup uh, that that try to do bridges, even uh, concrete timber composites. So th this happening, it's not completely new. It's a, there, are, there are a lot of applications. It's not a lot of so fancy looking, like you, you have this kind of raw look, but uh, yeah, you, you kind of use a bit uh, bigger dimensions uh, uh, as it was mentioned. But yeah, I mean, if you can get a tree and uh, from the forest and use to some extent, it's already happening that that's really I mean you can try this Emax Pro company to, to Google they 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 base a lot of business just on just on this in large, large scale already. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, I have a last question to Professor Tom. Hi. Hi. Yes, Professor. Um so uh uh, maybe uh, I have a question like uh, for a uh, general a uh, general question uh, because today uh, I think we have a lot of uh, audience from Asia and uh, mm -hmm. as we all know uh, right now the timber buildings developed very well in Europe and the North American part uh, because that uh, mm, I think uh, those places have a very good uh, forest resource. But like in Asia and in China, uh, we don't have uh, so much a uh, good um, trees uh, to produce like a uh, CLT. So mm. I would like to ask, um, uh, could you share your opinion uh, to your knowledge and experience on how the timber buildings will develop in future? And uh, mm. as I 
as I remember in the World Congress of Architecture held in Copenhagen this year. And uh, a lot of uh, architects and uh, engineers, uh, they come from all uh, uh, from the world. They also have a question uh, they want to ask uh, to the architects and the engineers from based in Scandinavia countries, because those countries, they have uh, they already have um, a lot of uh, high risk timber buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. It terms very well, and they ask them how they can um, also build such buildings in their own countries. Maybe they are limited with uh, local codes and uh, re um, resource. So I would like to ask your opinion from like in this part. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really interesting um, uh, question um, because I think it's it's something that um, I. Uh, had the privilege of talking about very recently. I'm in Seoul right now for a conference. So I've been talking to some architects over here and especially uh, people that are interested in timber and also engineers um, at, at, a, at a conference next door here um, about particularly this topic. So one thing that I've heard over the past week is um, is one is uh, if, there, if, if the industry here is reliant on imports from other countries, for example, Japanese timber or European timber, um, then it's difficult. Then, then you are kind of hostage, held hostage by the prices of the market. You no, know? it's it's very expensive to import things. You know that obviously that is very difficult then to do stuff because clients will say, no, it's 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 too much. Um, at the same time, the the local resource, like I learned, I learned about uh, Korean pine or red, yeah, Korean pine, um, and there were some problems with it in terms of strength, or somehow the, the way that it grew wasn't kind of optimal. It wasn't as close to you know Norwegian spruce as uh, as um, as as they would like. And what that means is that if there's no if there or if there's little knowledge or little precise data about using this particular species, it becomes very difficult to engineer with. So, but that's not to say that like it can't happen. Because, but what I what I did see was that there is there is a slow shift. Um, it is a small industry right now, which is also makes things difficult because they have to compete with concrete and all these other steel industries, right? Um, so there needs to be more of a demand from the client side of things. But also, even in just some of the presentations I saw, there were additions to the Korean building code to introduce um, about CLT, for example. So that knowledge is being actively tested and actively researched and put into codes to kind of make the guidelines for the future to, to be able to be kind of build and calculate more with, uh, for example, uh, CLT that's based on uh, Korean uh, pine, right? Um, this is just kind of the sort of overview that I've been able to get from just the past week of, of speaking with people here. Um, and we will see a sawmill tomorrow. But I, I would venture to guess that maybe there are similar conversations happening in other places as well, where the knowledge is, it'll take a, it'll take a while for it to kind of become more popularized. Um, I think it's a similar problem in, uh, or has been a similar problem in, in Canada as well, where the industry is just smaller. So maybe the demand for that kind of specialized production is very low. Um, so it becomes tricky for producers to kind of really invest in that kind of stuff, because if it's such a small and risky part of their business, um, it becomes difficult to, to maintain. So I think what you touch upon is a very interesting aspect, which we very often don't talk about, which is the whole kind of sociopolitics and economics of everything that we're talking about in these, these these presentations because for these things to actually kind of take off um uh kind of in a wider sense um there are a lot of things that are not necessarily related to technical things or or even design things that need to be addressed a lot of it is like codes regulations and, and knowledge exchange so i think maybe one way is just to improve and continue the exchange of knowledge um, I know through 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 UIA, for example. I mean, just kind of having people visit and 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 share their experiences and 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 share the knowledge um, that can improve. And through uh, I think deeper investigations of local resources. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, uh, from that conferences, I remember uh, there is a, a architect. They ask the uh, the designer from the white. Architect, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the design studio from Sweden. Yeah, and, yeah I know them well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, I remember the answer from the presenta uh, pre presenter. Uh, he mm -hmm. said that there there is um, nothing, uh, not too good solution for that, because for mm -hmm. example, um, like uh, uh, in Norway, they develop uh, timber buildings for more than fifteen years, 
And uh, so until right now, they have uh, so much wood timber buildings. And uh, he answered that waiting and do our best. So in the yeah. future, there will be someday like uh, the timber buildings can attract people's attention. So thank yeah. you for like uh, all your uh, um, sharing. Like, yeah. You're welcome. And I think I think it's, um, I really try to remain an optimist. I think I think there are very exciting possibilities. And I think it's, it comes down to, uh, or I think a, a, a big, if I think sharing knowledge and getting the knowledge out there and, and you know, training people kind of, you know, multiplying that knowledge um, is, is a very good step in the right direction. I really believe mm. that. Yeah, I think the thing's getting better because I would like to share some of my own experience. Uh, like a four and five years ago, uh, I'm always uh, interested in timber buildings. And I was uh, in China and uh, I fixed the, the, tech, uh, the time like to attending online meetings that happened in Europe. And right now, mm -hmm. as I located in Europe and I'm uh, I'm attending an online meeting like uh, the, the host come from China. So I think uh, yes. there already some good things happened and more and more people start to pay attention to this field. So I'm very exactly. glad. Yeah, yes. some of us just need to stay up later and some of us need to get up earlier in the world <laughs> so that we can all so that we can all talk together. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you know, thanks to all of the panelists for making today's session so meaningful, and it's it has been it, so it has been a pleasure hosting for the for the event, and I hope all of us find it uh, inspiring as we as we did. So please stay connected with us, and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube and Bilibili as soon as possible. And finally, on behalf of Architecture Digital Futures, I extend my warmest thanks to you all. So see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.